part time, but you know, again, I, I like the multi, the, even multi income source uh, thing. It's not totally necessarily accurate, but that's probably better than some of the others. But anyways, the question I want to raise is: a part time church less than a real church? Um, my point this afternoon is going to be a part-time church is a real church. In fact, it's most real churches. I think part of the problem is that when, we, when the average person thinks of church, they think of what they see in the media or on TV or, or you know, you watch your programs on TV. Uh, of course, I don't know if they're always the best examples, but they think of the mega church the megachurch model, um, or churches feel like they have to copy that model in order to be effective. There's the idea, well, gee whiz, you know, uh, uh, Saddleback is doing it that way, and we ought to, with our 10 people, ought to be a mini version of Saddleback, of, of what the church is. And the public, not just within the church, but I think the public does. They think a church it's one of the big arguments to say, well, we ought to take away their tax exempt status and sit down all these millions of dollars worth of property, you know, and that's one of the big things you'll hear people say in the secular world outside the church. And when most churches are barely hanging on, they're small, they, they're, they might have buildings that, I, that, that John the Baptist personally dedicated. Um, you know, they're, they're so old. I mean, they're older, definitely older than the people we have there, and they're, they're plenty old, some of them. So, I mean, we, we, we have to understand that. that I think sometimes we get this idea that a part-time church is somehow less than a real church. And, and that's, and, 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 and oftentimes it's from our own parishioners that feel that way. Um, the fear that if we were to move and transition to a part-time church, somehow we will no longer be a real church. And although it's changing, there was a day, real pastors, pastor, are uh, full-time, that is their calling, that's their only calling, so be it. And I think we're seeing with the trends of society that that concept, and hopefully it's changing, but it hasn't totally changed yet. So we're going to be talking about that in this session. <coughs> so let's take a look at some things here. Here's some of the bad. I want to talk about the bad than the good. Part-time ministry is often associated with decline. Unfortunately, and I hate to say it, oftentimes it's true. I mean, there are examples where that is true. Churches are part-time because they've been in decline from they've been in decline and out of an act of desperation, this is the route they're going. And I wish I could guarantee you that by coming to this seminar, that your church is suddenly going to be a thriving, growing church. But there's the elephant in the room. And I think probably the toughest element there is, we have congregations that are simply going to close their doors. I mean, that's the elephant in the room. We don't want to talk about that. A lot of congregations are in denial. Some of us pastors are in denial. I mean, I'm not looking here to close your church there. But the reality is, the bad news in all this, there are some churches, but it still does not make them any less of a church. Um, I happen to, um, one of my... Uh, Interesting, most interesting experiences. I think it was Oneonta, the First Baptist Church of Oneonta closed down. And I was there for their closing service. Uh, Jim and Jerry couldn't make it. I think it was their commitments that day. I attended that. They celebrated. And there's actually a movement called Legacy Churches where they actually use the assets that they have to start new ministries. So even though that congregation died, the ministry did not. That particular organizational congregation died, but they began new ministries. I heard about one church in California. They had closed their doors. They were down to like five or six people, all elderly. They knew they weren't going to keep going. They closed their doors, and but from their assets started 23 new ministries. And they, so that may very well be, in some of our congregations, may very well be the legacy we leave. 
And I mean, that's the elephant nobody wants to talk about. Because, I mean, to admit death, I mean, we had a hard enough time when we're talking about when our patients are terminally ill, you know, we have family members are terminally ill, but, you know, there are some churches, unfortunately, have reached that point. Now, it's hard to know exactly when, um, when uh, that is going to be. Each church situation is different. Uh, but I think that's something that, you know, that's the bad. I mean, there are some churches, quite frankly, are they, are they, they are where they are because they're in serious decline. One thing I almost did for this workshop, but it might be for another day, because it's just the time-wise. I don't know if any of you have read any, seen any George Bolliard stuff, The Life Cycle of a Church. Go online, look up uh, George Bolliard stuff about life cycles and where your church is in the life cycle. That's a, that, again, because of time, I could not include that here. But that, that's some helpful stuff, because it'll help you to see maybe where your church is in the life cycle and uh, to evaluate that. And I've done some stuff with that in some of my consulting and workshop stuff too with churches. So again, that, that's just something that, uh, and that's the bad, but you know, that's reality. And, and again, I don't want to sugarcoat that. Um, I mean, we don't want to talk about it because we don't like to talk about death. And, and, and God is a God of resurrection. And, but you know, I will say that he may resurrect that church in a way that we don't expect. It may be through through the, actually the closure of one ministry, new ministries are started. You know, whether it's from the assets or whatever. And again, that's kind of the elephant in the room. Nobody wants, and we don't see it, we don't see it, we don't see it. But, you know, that's, that's, that's a painful thing. I, I, I'm not saying it's easy, but I did want to at least bring that up. Okay, the, the good though, in some parts of the country, part-time is being embraced as a new ministry opportunity. And um, pages 90 and 91, you can read about that in the book. Uh, he talks about that. One interesting thing, uh, I, went to a I was, was on a webinar with Tom Rainier, who's written a number of things. He's a church consultant, has done a lot of stuff like that. But Tom and his webinar, believe it or not, they are starting a certificate in bivocational and co-vocational ministry. The, they have certificate programs, so instead of just your typical certification programs, they're actually, they can get, they take so many courses on bivocational and co-vocational ministry, they actually can earn a certificate in that field. They actually will have a, they have like, a, I think it's like a 30-week plan, something like that, of course, and there's a number of, of sessions they can take, but I thought that was interesting. So, I mean, there are, there are, uh, and, and basically his contention is, especially since COVID, um, we're seeing many more congregations in this position. Uh, again, he said, uh, I think out of 350,000 clergy in the United States, 200,000 are in part-time situations. I think it might even be more than that. I did a quick calculation last night when you shared that that works out to about 57%. So New York is above average yeah. in that, but it's not, you know, it's nothing, nothing that to the northeast. Right. Northeast would be probably the least church in northwest of the United States. Those two areas are the least church. We're in them. By the way, and I think Jim, didn't you say, I think it was a recent newsletter, you talked about us being a mission field. I think, wasn't it you that said that? Yes. Yes. Read Jim's lot. Read an excellent article. Yeah, I'm putting a plug in for ABC NYS. Okay. There you go. Okay, there you go. But now, I mean, just, we are a mission field. And we're thinking cross-culturally in some of this stuff, but also trying to get back to our roots. So, I mean, I think that's, that's something that we really have to understand. We are, we are in a mission field. Uh, and that, especially this part of the, of, of the country, you know, that 57%, he's talking nationwide, and he mainly works with Southern Baptists, which would probably, uh, that's in the buckle of the Bible belt. So that might be more church than what you see in the Northeast. So we probably, that's probably might explain some of our percentages. But again, you have to you have to see that that that's a. But again, there's some good things happening. People are beginning to be more and more aware. The fact that you're here, I don't know if we would have pulled this off four or five years ago, having this many people here just talking about this. I mean, certainly we wouldn't be doing the Zoom call. Hi, Zoomers. Just make sure. Yeah, they're there. They're waving. Okay. <laughs> that's it's, it's hard because you know you're trying to teach here, and I'm going. Oh yeah, there are people that are alive. They're on the screen. Okay. Now, changing the culture of part-time goes beyond congregational transformation, but extends to the associational, regional, and national level. And I think one of the things that American Baptists, and I know we have at least not only our regional staff, but we have one staff member that's been participating as well from national, um, 
I think one of the burning questions over the next few years is going to be how do we track the number of churches that have no full-time clergy? How are denominational structures currently set up to account for part-time ministries? Not only statistics, but how we have been doing the ABPS, American Baptist Personnel Services. Um, how are pensions and insurance is going to work with all this? You know, I think one thing that's interesting because, you know, it used to be when, you know, I know when I uh, first started in ministry and, and 40 years ago, in 1981, it's been exactly 40 years, the thing that I find was that what was expected you, you would put into M&M pension, and of course we had M&M health at that time, we had American Baptist health, of course, my, but we found it was cheaper going through my wife's job because she had better insurance for a cheaper price. I mean, that was the reality. But on my m and pension, the church put so much into that because they assume you're full-time and th that they would pay that portion of your pension. Well, what do you do in churches where you're basically, the church is, is, pretty, much a, uh, is pretty much a preaching station or you have very minimal hours there? Maybe you have somebody coming in one or two days a week smaller churches, they probably are not going to participate in the pension program. Um, and what does that mean in terms of how the pension program will be set up in the future? Uh, again, I don't have the financial or pension answer. Uh, that's not my specialty. But I think how the whole denominational substructure is going to work with this new reality, I think is going to be, as, and already is, is a crucial question that we'll be dealing with. Um, as being Presbyterian as well as being Baptist, I mean, let you know that Presbyterian Church is a, is a very active statistical aspect. There's even work down on how to, how to pay attention to stuff like that for, for people in half time, quarter time, part time, all the way down to even down to one eighth time. So they oh. actually work out this whole thing. And try to okay. Again, I don't know this full because I'm I'm on I'm receiving M and M benefits, so I'm not sure how they're doing it now in the M and M. But I think those are all questions, and I and the Presbyterians are doing this. That's kind of interesting because that's a, that is a burning question, I think, in how the whole structure ABPS. I mean, we've made some changes recently where you can do it online. You can actually you can actually update your profile immediately. It used to be oh my, I I, I still remember those forms they used to send to us with all oh, uh, you have the code. Z one two three eight six eight. You know that all these codes. I mean that that's. A, I said. I mean. I mean. It took me a year to go through Greek and Hebrew. I. I. I, I mean this. This. It was like that. That was crazy. And of course, we were doing that up to re not all that long ago. I mean, had all these little cold names. If you and you had all these different skills you could have in ministry, um, able to shovel snow walk, snow <laughs> sidewalks in the front. So that's that's cold uh, S N for snow. Snow one eight two six seven. I mean, I mean, you know. <laughs> but they assumed, I think, really, and for many years, kind of a full time. This is all that you do, kind of thing. And I think that's part of the. There's been some changes there, but hopefully. We're thinking more and more along those lines, uh, especially if 80% of our churches, if that's the rule. Uh, that's a, that changes the ballgame, how we even do the whole pension thing, how we do denominational placement, calling pastors to churches. Uh, that, is, that is, I think, a burning question that we, that we have to wrestle with. And I think we are, and I think the fact, and I appreciate, Jim and Jared, how you have, you're, you're, you're really trying to deal with this as, as, as regional staff, but it's, it, is a, it is an issue. This is a new, kind of, a, kind of a, a challenge for us that maybe we weren't having all that maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Okay, so that really then comes discussion time. And we're not going to break into groups, so we'll just do this in unity, unison, I guess. I don't know about unity, you know, Baptists. <coughs> Six Baptists, seven opinions, you know how it works. Um, anyways, here's a discussion question. On page 91, McDonald writes Mainline denominations don't keep yearly data on how many congregations have no full-time clergy. In other words, they're not tracking the universe of churches that have unplugged from their re respective denominations' usual assumption about how churches are and ought to be organized. Because you can't improve what you don't measure, denominations are living in a costly state of denial. Here's a question. Do you agree with his statement or not? Why or why not? And I'll open it up for discussion. Anybody want to take a stab at that question? <laughs> yeah, I agree with him. Okay. 
Elaborate. Um, I think that uh, the denial part of this uh, is probably stemming down from the seminary level. Uh, because you, you, of course, it's been a long time since I've been in seminary. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Okay, so as Mike was sharing, you know, things have changed. But the assumption back then was that you were going to go into full-time ministry. And I think that, that this, this assumption um, in, that they're not tracking it now uh, is, is reflective of, of denial. Okay, and I wonder too, how many of us that are in the leadership positions in, in, in our churches and in, in our denomination for, as a whole, graduated from seminary before 1990, or 19, year 2000 even? That's a good question, because, because, because a lot of us are coming from that same reference point that I did, that I talked about early, that he challenged me on about what he did, because you graduated, you said, in 2000 and 2020. 2020. So, I mean, your experience of seminary was quite a bit different than mine. So, and how many of us that are in leadership positions have been, that, that is the, that's the culture that we were brought up in, and, that, and of course, and of course, then you, get, you translate it to the pews, how many people in our churches would have been that age when they graduated from high school or college or wherever they were in the churches, you know, how many of our people would be the pre-2020 era, the pre-2000 era, where that was kind of the cultural norm, okay? So, yeah, maybe that's a good point. You know, maybe just how that's perceived, at least for those of us who maybe have had that experience from prior views of seminary. Yes? Um, this actually reminds me what you said earlier about the old profiles and how they work. I graduated a little after 2000 from seminary, and it was right around the time Monster.com came out and all of these online job search sites came out where you could edit and make your own profile right online. And we were still with those books cross-referencing PS 492. Oh, gosh. Um, see, I can use a CD radio was one of them. Um, and I was saying we need to stream, because the world is streamlining now right online, not even printing out on resume paper. And I was the bad guy for saying that. And now it's, it seemed crazy at the time. Now it's there. But I, but also related to that, kind of interesting, they have all the stats on our kids' sports, how many assists, how many goals, um, and we don't keep enough stats in the church. So it actually makes a good point. If we had the stats in front of us, would we have a clear model to work with? Because we know we're not quite, we know we got a little left behind, but it's almost like we can't quite put a finger on how that happened. All right. I think one of the things that was said last night, because we kind of talked a little bit about this, one of the problems is getting churches to report those stats. Mm -hmm. And that's the other, because Baptist churches, whether I, I, know, I know none of you have ever had this experience, but Baptist churches are notoriously independent and, you know, uh, we'll do things our way. Um, it's not like the Methodists where you have a bishop that can kind of, you know, lean on them a little bit. It's called appropriations, you know, like, you know, you're just supposed to give us money. Um, so far, Jim and Jared don't have the power to go around and say, uh, and do a shakedown or anything like that on, on anything from us. And so, statistically, one of the problems really is how do we get congregations to talk about this stuff and to let us, you know, to kind of, and not, not that we're just into numbers because we're kind of in a numbers game, but it does help us to, to discern exactly where we are. We, we take our best estimates and our best guess, but that's, that is a factor, you know, and that, but I think it's important. Statistics do help in helping us understand what the trends are. I mean, I mean, you look at George Barna and all the research that he's done in terms of church stuff, uh, how the, the, the attendance trends and all this stuff. I mean, it's not the final say about things, but it gives us an idea and we have some biblical support for that numbers 13 what did they do before they went into the promised land they spied out the land they wanted to know what the what the land was like and they wanted to know what kind of food was there they did all kinds of research in terms of trying to understand the, the exact land that God had promised them so it's not without biblical support to do it that way but uh, it's it's hard to get some of our churches to understand that maybe this would be an important exercise for us to do that yeah, Jerry yeah, um, you'd mentioned we have a national staff. I'm going to 
uh, Pop open Meg's mic so you'll hear her. You may not see her, uh, but she works with ABPS and the Ministry Line platform. Uh, so Meg, can you hear us? I can. Okay, you just want to share, just real brief, um, a couple of things you're doing to kind of parallel the discussion we're having today. Yeah, so as Jared said, um, I'm the National Coordinator for Ministry Life, um, which is the website, so if you haven't been there, um, we can tell you more about that, and ADPS. Um, it has completely changed your information if you're still um have your information from the old system is is out there so um we can get you and to resurrect that so to speak um so we are very well aware of the issues that everyone is facing um myself and um erica van brakel um, we both served as pastors. Um, I was once a pastor in New York State, Hagop, um, in Central Square, and so I mean, we get it. Part of it is is that yeah, we need that information from churches, from regions, um, because we're Baptist and that's the way we roll. Not everybody is forthcoming with information. Um, what I am currently actively working on now is um, really focusing on this part-time role and how we can make changes to the to the profile system and um, you know hopefully facilitate conversation within the denomination. I'm putting together uh, webinars and. Um, Podcast, and I talked to Steve just a, a little bit this morning, and we're going to have a further conversation um, about being a part of one of those webinars and, and podcasts where we talk about um, what is ministry like? What does it really um, look like? How is it functioning? What are these current models and the trends, especially post-pandemic, post-Christendom um, kind of thing? So... Um, just keep communicating with your region. That's so important. Communicate with us at ABHMS. Um, if you need help with your profile, you give me a call. Show up virtually in a As many people want to be involved in conversations and things like that. So. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, because I tell you that and it's good to hear what's happening. So they're, they're, the, the denomination is wherever, but it's a it's been a process for sure. It's been a you know it's a, you know it's it's a, a, a new challenge for us, and especially with COVID. I, again, I think it was brought up yesterday. What COVID has done has really made this even more pertinent. Okay. So, any other comments on this particular question? Yes. You know, is it is a part-time church less than a real church? I would argue that our church is very much a full-time church. Yeah. We just happen to have a part-time staff. Group. Right. Um, and and you know it does. You know our language. We haven't wrapped our heads around the fact that this is a, a model that actually can work. We do, as we suggest, you know, seem to think of it as as a failure. Right. And, and part of the problem, I have yet to come up with the, the term I feel most comfortable with. And I said that at the very beginning yesterday. Um, I personally, and, like, and it, it stems way back before all this conversation about part-time, full-time. But again, and I'll reiterate for those maybe who missed it yesterday, there's that person would come up to me and say, I've been called to full-time Christian service. And that usually means I'm going to be a pastor or a missionary. And I'm going to get paid for it. Let's be honest. It's going to be my vocation is full-time Christian service. Well, I don't think the New Testament makes that distinction. When we think about, once we are a disciple of Jesus Christ, we've made our, a commitment of faith in Jesus Christ and trust Him as Lord and Savior. Like it or not, we are in full-time Christian service for the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. That should be an amen. You know, I mean, that, I mean, that is the, 
so I think that whole idea that I guess what, and, and the definitions we're using really deal with the with how people in ministry, uh, pastoral ministry, and other staff positions are, are compensated. So this really gets down to compensation, how, how they are supported financially, uh, ministry-wise, for whatever reasons. You know, we talked about the different models, bivocational, co-vocational, all that stuff that we've been talking about. So yeah, the part-time thing, I'm not totally comfortable with the term. In fact, when I, when I said what the name of my workshop was, those two pastors from Watsontown, PA, they had, I hate, we hate, basically, it's, okay, okay, yeah, I, I get it, I get it. We hate that term. We hate that term. I don't like it either. I don't like it. Because, it, because we're in full, you know, I don't care if you get, you know, like I said, that kind of that joke yesterday, um, I, get, I, I, I get paid for being good and the congregation's good for nothing. No, I mean, that's not a good way of putting it. But I mean, the, the whole idea is that every believer in Jesus Christ is, is in full-time service. Just some of us get compensated different ways. And we get compensated in a way that would be equivalent of what we would call a full-time vocation. And others, we get compensated, or the time that we put in may be, may be less than that. So, and there's different degrees of that. And that's what makes this whole thing rather complicated. And the terminology, you're right. It, it's not the, and I still quite haven't put my finger, I'm still struggling with it too. What's putting my finger on, I think you use, Jared, all multi-income sources. And, and even there, you know, that's somewhat not a perfect, perfect definition. It's, it's, I think it's, it's, just, it's just a different kind of thing. Um, well, what I find so discouraging, apart from statistics, is, um, you know, you go into these sanctuaries, we have these beautiful sanctuaries that are empty. And, and you know, that's apart from all the other stuff, the programs, the finances, or the, you just, you know, when you hear people talk of the days when the balcony was full and stuff like that, you know, that you just, everything in your being wants to reverse that, you know. And, uh, yeah. He talks, you know, in one of the chapters about, you know, taking up the pews, and I think that's pretty radical. Yeah. Well, I have probably, in my consulting, and please don't, of course, I'm doing this online, I'm going to get in trouble with this. Well, well, can I take a shot? I have jokingly have said in some of our buildings, I'm going to start a ministry called Arsonist for Jesus. <laughs> because, I mean, because, because one, this is a whole other conversation. And folks, don't, that, that's, that's a joke, okay? Don't, don't, don't go put it on Facebook. Oh, okay, look at that. He's going to burn up his all down. No, 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 no. My, my, I jokingly say about that. But the thing is, um, one of the whole conversations is, and I, and I actually do a workshop on called uh, The Small Church in a Changing World. I actually do a small church workshop that I've done with churches and stuff like that. So I do a, like a one-day thing with churches on small church. One of the things that I think that we, that are part of this equation, because this is the other thing, the big ticket items, if you're talking about the finances of the church, is the pastor's salary in the building. And some of us are slaves to our building. I mean, they're beautiful architecturally, uh, everything else. Uh, but what do you do when you have 10 people and this place holds 400 and you got this big monstrosity of a building? It's beautiful. I mean, you don't want to, you know, what do you do with it? I mean, how, how do you, that, that, I mean, it's one thing to go part time, it's cut back on the pastor's salary. It's a, it gets more challenging trying to figure out. What do you do with all this space that you have that's more building than you really are using at this time? And that, then do you sell it? Do you, do you, do you, do you put, take the pews out and put fewer seats in? Do you meet in a smaller room? There's, there's all kinds of ramifications about that because people are really into space. And one of the things we talk about, I think, is the, the facility question. It's a whole other ball game with this uh, because that's the other big ticket. I mean, imagine having a seminar on part-time building. So we're, but certainly building use, you know, how do we use the building? And some of the buildings, I know, I, I know in one situation, um, you know, they say, well, the easy answer is we'll get outside groups to use it. Well, this building needs so much renovating, I don't know if they'd even be up to code. Do you have outside groups to use it? So th there's a lot of other questions with this that, that complicate this picture. Because they think of the good old days, people come in there, I remember when this place was full. <laughs> Now it seems like people are full of it. You know, they're kind of that attitude. You know, they're, they're just, uh, we, they wish that we could go back to those days, those glory days, when everything was hunky-dory and peachy king and we were full here. Um, 
man, sometimes the highlight of our year is a funeral of a famous person in town because that's the only time the church is full. I mean, or a wedding. You know, those are the kinds of things I think it's, uh, it's those are the kinds of things that I think we also struggle with. Yeah. I mean, is this part-time pastorate, is it really anybody's business except between the church and the trustees or your board or whatever? Yeah, I'm not, I don't introduce myself as a part-time Right, pastor. right. I, you know, I don't put it, I'm a part-time chiropractor. I'm not advertising myself as a part-time chiropractor. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm not just going to adjust your neck. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So, it's, it's like... As long as you don't confuse the two. <laughs> so, so it's, it's, it's something that, um, it's really nobody's business is what I'm trying to say. Right. Except what it is that I've, I'm not going to tell people what I'm going to make as a chiropractor. I'm not going to tell people what I'm making, a, you know, through the church. It's something that we've, we've negotiated for right. as a salary, and it happens to be part-time. Right. And, and beyond that, it really isn't anybody else's business. Yeah, and, that, and you're right. I think we're, we're the main thing we struggle with is when what people's expectations are within the church especially. And also, just like that example I gave yesterday about the funeral director, who wanted the pastor to come and do a sermon, uh, do a funeral service, because it's, it's a very small town. He was like the only church in town, and he wanted a funeral service at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday, but the guy was at work. And uh, there's where people make it their business, whether it's their business or not, because the old pastor was there full time, could, could just come over any time and do a funeral service at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday, but they have a job that has a shift and they can't be there. So I think, yeah, you're right. It's not anybody's business per se, but it's the expectations yeah, yeah, right. and I mean, perception of the, right. of the church and the people in the community. Yeah. Several years ago, I, I talked with a person from Rhode Island churches who shared that her job as a layperson was to assist her pastor. And so if there was a funeral that came up during uh, designated you know, days of the week, where they knew the pastor wasn't available, she did the funerals. Wow. And that's, you know, 20 plus years ago that that model was, was told to me. Uh, I do think that sometimes, though, we do have folks who don't think it's really um, legit unless the pastor is personally doing it. I, I've had congregants in my previous church say, well, uh, you know, I, I, I really don't think the church cares unless the pastor's there. Yeah. And I'm like, Okay, those are your issues. <laughs> <laughs> the issues that people definitely feel. And it's kind of like what I talked about yesterday about the prayer. You know, like somehow when they ask you to pray, like that way that weighs more than their prayer. You know, like if they invite you to dinner, sometimes they expect you as a pastor to pray. Well, maybe they, since we're their guests, it might not be a bad thing for them to pray. Yeah, they would. That was a question from Nancy Hughes from the Dell High Church. Uh, she's sharing that she thinks this is the perception of the current congregation. That is what we need to address, but how do we do that? Okay, the perception is that? Perception is what, Nancy? Let me unmute you, it might be faster. Go ahead. Um, basically, what, what I mean is that how do we address the congregation who, well, to quote one person, there's no way we're going to have a part-time pastor. <laughs> what do you do? And, and in her mind, that means the church is dying. What do, how do we address that with the current congregation? I mean, no globally this thing is it, but what do we do to address the congregation? I mean, there are some people that know that that's not the issue. But for those, but in general, that is the congregation's feel. How do we address that? And I'm saying we because my pastor and I are both on this call. I think that the the biggest challenge, unfortunately, is this one person in particular that's main. So it's not. So it's a general. Okay, I think um, the reality is, and I think I said this earlier, to do this takes time with that person, and that's a hard thing. See, teaching what scripture teaches about tent making ministry certainly there are I think certainly from a pastor standpoint I think there can be a lot of teaching and preaching on this where you could talk about uh, what you know I guess the question what is the church is the church the pastor you know I think it might even come down to the basic question what is the church 
It's a body of believers. What does that mean? Now, unfortunately, there may be people who will never get it. Uh, but if you have enough leaders that, can, that are on board with this, then you, then you go with who's ready to go on board with it and you move continually teach and guide and disciple. I wish there was an easy answer to saying, oh, we can convince them in one seminar or one session. But I think some of the things I talked about, the process of educating, 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 uh, talk to them about what they're, you know, maybe asking questions. What are your expectations? What do you think a pastor is? Uh, could we open up the Bible and understand what, is the, what, is the, what does our faith say about what a pastor is? I mean, I guess the best way I think of it is, is just tr uh, teaching and guiding a person. But it's, it's, it's a hard question if they're st set in their ways or people are set in their ways. You know, and, and really, what's the reality? I mean, sometimes there may be, need to be a reality in the check. What, what, maybe the question to ask is, what happens if we do nothing? What happens if we do nothing about asking what the role of, a, and using, I hate the word part-time, but let's say for the sake of meeting. What happens if we don't address this as a church? What, what, is, what will be the end result? Do we, do we, do we no longer, do we no, you know, what, what, what do we become? Where, where, do, where is God leading us as a church? I guess that's, that's really the only thing I can say. I don't know. I know it probably does not adequately answer your question. It's, 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 a, it's a, complex, a complex issue, especially when people have it in their minds that that's what a pastor ought to do. And sometimes you just got to keep, sometimes, I found, sometimes you just got to repeat, 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 and repeat. Um, sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it takes an outside voice to come in and say, you know what, folks? This is, you know, an outside, some outside help, you know, and just having somebody come in that's not directly invested into the church. At my second church, we had a group of younger people who wanted... Can you hear Jim back there, by the way? Yeah. Now, they, well, I shouldn't say younger people. Well, we, we had a group of people who wanted to expand ministry and do more, and so we created a committee on church renewal, and we came up with, like, a seven-point plan. And some of the points were not well received by a few people in the church. And as I talked to that committee, I said, the reality is not all people will make all journeys. Our choice is to sit where we are and do nothing or to move ahead and in moving ahead realize we will leave some people behind. All right. Did you hear that? I asked, if the people will leave, I mean, not people, but you know, they're, they're going to come, they're going to sit, you know, you do a nice funeral, you visit an hospital. I mean, they're going to withdraw in a lot of ways. But the question is, who is the future of the church? Hmm. These people who will not go down this road, are they the future? No. Yeah, that was a hard decision, but not all people will make all journeys. You know, they're just not going to, and yet this is not a choice. Nancy, did you hear that? She's muted again. Did you want to bring her up again? No, I just wanted, did she hear it? Yes, no, I, I, you're muted. She did? She did. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing to realize, so one of the hats that I wear is a deputy mayor Oh, you're deputy mayor? I am deputy Wow. wow. And so, I mean, we've been talking about church stuff, right? But when, when I first was elected in 2012, we had a full-time police chief. 2% of the town of 1,800 people. We have a part-time 20-hour police chief now. When I was elected, we had a full-time cleaner, a guy whose job was to clean all the municipal buildings. There wasn't, there wasn't enough for this man to do. So now that's a part-time position. So this, I mean, we're talking about it in the context of churches, but this is really happening throughout our our society that people are looking for different models that are often less than that 40-hour week, which was a reaction to what came before it, right? Right. And, and maybe some of the pushback from some people is the fact that uh, the church is one of the last bastallions of of, uh, of, tradition. of tradition that it's hard to let go of. I mean, that's that's maybe that's why there's pushback. You know, it's happening in our police chief. It's happening with our cleaner. Um, 
Well, we got an assistant mayor here and a chiropractor. So <laughs> you have people's back and you have to watch your back. <laughs> uh, it's, well, my mind works in strange ways after lunch, okay. But no, I, it, but I think, I mean, I know it's a, Nancy, that's a really tough question because it's, it, it, I think it's just constantly, constantly putting it out before people and, and trying to encourage them. And unfortunately, change is going to have some people that will never get on board with it. They'll either give you all kinds of headaches or some will leave. Um, we don't want to lose people. We might be down to a handful now, but so people have to understand not if change is going to, not, not if, we, if we're supposed to change. Change is going to happen one way or another. And if we've learned anything about COVID, who would have thought before March of 2020 we'd be sitting here looking at you on Zoom and doing this kind of thing and doing the stuff we've done for the last year and a half. I could not imagine it in my wildest imagination. I, 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 it, it, it just, I almost feel like I'm in, I almost feel like I'm, I'm in an episode of Star Trek and I've kind of gone on to some other planet. This wasn't the world we were living in a year and a half. So change has happened. And, and people may not like this at times. Uh, I mean, the, but wake up and smell the coffee. I mean, the, the people are going to have to do that. But that's going to take some time with people. And the hard thing is, I know you love those people, and, they, and they're, you're, they're part of your fellowship. There's the emotional uh, cost. You know, I think we talk a lot about the cost of following Jesus. One of the costs, I think, is the emotional cost. I mean, it's, it's heart-wrenching to, to deal with the fact that there's people who are not necessarily going to be on board with this. Um, but we have to do where we feel God's leading us, if God is leading us in that direction. And again, there's a lot of, and it doesn't mean that uh, you don't listen to them and you don't converse with them, but it's, it's one of the, but, but this whole thing is, it's a, it's, a, it's a, we're talking about a major shift in some of our churches. Some of our churches have made that shift, but it didn't come without blood, sweat, and tears. And that wasn't just a rock group in the 70s, by the way. You know, I mean, it, so I, I, I don't know, I don't know how it's, how it's better to answer that question. That's, a, that's one of those ones that, you know, I just want to encourage you to keep trying to, to, to convey that uh, and, and try to communicate. And again, I think we have Scripture to support this. I really do. I mean, I would not be doing this if I didn't feel Scripture. The basic premise of Scripture is the priesthood of all believers and what the church is. It's not necessarily, I mean, I do, a, I do a workshop, and I did it with First Baptist Endicott. I worked with their deacons last week. I actually do a segment workshop. It's called, Is Your Church a Movement of God or an Institution? And we identify what makes your church an institution. And I have a little quiz that people can do afterwards, and they, and they, uh, they play with that. And I, I mean, that was another piece I could have added to this. I was tempted to do that, but that may be, that'll be for another day. But, but we look at... Where do you see your church? Is your church more institutionalized or is it really a movement? You know, and, and what is it going to take to get to that movement? And, and, if it's, and if it's institutionalized, how do we then begin to help folks to move towards movement? What does it mean to be a movement of God? And I think that what we're going through right now with these cultural changes, especially with uh, what happened after COVID, uh, we, are, we, are in, we are at a crossroads, I think denominationally, I think we're at a crossroads regionally, I think we're at a crossroads in many of our churches. I preach at a lot of different churches. We're either going to have to choose whether we're going to be the movement of God or whether we're going to be an institution. We're at a crossroads, even more so now. And that's, that's a hard, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm 69 years old, I hate change. I'm, I'm rather comfortable, thank you. But I see, and, and having the opportunity of having preached in churches and being in different churches, I see what's happening. And, you know, that's why I'm passionate about this stuff, because it's, it's just, it's there. But, and I'm not sure how we totally resolve it yet. That's the part of the other problem. I, I'm, I'm one of these guys that wants to know, hey God, billboard, tell me what to do next. Give me a sign here. And, and sometimes we just kind of kind of trottle on and try to figure this out as we go along. But again, hopefully some of these things we're talking about here are really addressing, at least beginning to address some of those things. So I don't know if that answers your question at all. But anyways. Okay, let's move on here. What's, what's our, that's something we can talk about. Okay, removing the stigma involves. 
Okay. Here's some things that we should be thinking about. I think one of the stigmas, and I think for those of us, and I think, again, this is changing. Some of these things are changing. I think for a long time, the idea of part-time clergy were not a threat. Sometimes, a lot of times it almost feels like, you know, if we go totally part-time, and it's true of our churches, and I think it's true of our pastors, that does that mean us full-timers will become obsolete? So I think there's a little bit of that feeling, although I think that's changed. I think there was a time um, where lay pastors were really considered, or part-time pastors were really almost considered to be uh, inferior to full-time pastors. I like to think that's changed a lot. I have seen it change. But I think a lot of, in terms of what our expectations were, in terms of, of uh, training and uh, the MDiv thing, um, the expectations of a full-time church type of thing. Um, again, we should not be threatened by this. I think really, I don't think that, if, let's say you have an MDiv, you've been fully trained, as pastor in terms of, with the Masters of Divinity, the traditional seminary model, just because we're moving more into lay-led pastorates, people have gone through the lay studies program, been certified in lay studies, I actually think our role is even more significant in the fact that we do have, many of us who have gone that route have had years of ministry experience. I think it counts for something. We've had a certain amount of training I think one of the real benefits that I've had is being able to use my years of experience to do things like this, to do lay studies classes. Um, I don't bemoan that at all. I don't, you know, and I, and my person don't feel threatened by it. In fact, I welcome it. I mean, I'm teaching a lay studies class right now. There was an issue that came up in somebody's church. I said, uh, maybe you need to talk to your pastor and your church about this. He went back and talked to his pastor and his church about the situation, and they are going to make the, some of the changes that I suggested maybe they ought to be thinking about. They're beginning to have a conversation about that. That, to me, where I see my role as one who's gone through the traditional model of full-time ministry. But I think there's a time that some of us felt kind of threatened by this change, particularly towards lay ministry. You know, well, unless you have that three-year seminary degree, if some of us were in the five- or six-year plan, but that, that MDiv, you know, and you've gone that traditional model. I'm not bemoaning that. It's not a bad thing. But I think what we're seeing, there's different models. It does not, does not have to be a threat to us. And hopefully that is changing. He kind of brings that out in the book, too. That's why I put it here. But I think there was that, there was that kind of stigma that is in the process of changing. Um, um, I think one of the challenges I am finding with all with this, and this is kind of a subdivision of this, is what to do about those who are bivocational and who have jobs outside of their pastorate. Because it used to be the clergy would meet once a month for mutual support. Thursday mornings, local coffee shop, let's talk and share. One of the challenges, and I have, again, this is not something I resolve, because we have several people in our association that, I, that I'm with um, that work. And so how do, we, how do we coordinate schedules? How do we do this where we, don't wanna, where we don't want people who are in a position where they are working uh, feel uh, left out of the, of the loop of pastors? That's a real challenge right now. You know, the scheduling thing, I mean, it's not as easy to have that pastor's meeting Wednesday mornings over coffee and maybe somebody does a little program and we all have time of sharing and that kind of thing. It's not as easy to do that as it once was. There's a lot more juggling of the, of the, uh, of the uh, schedules and how do we do that? And that's a, that's a real issue. And especially if we're talking about different models of bivocational ministry, you might be working 3 to 11, you might work in 7 to 3, you might be working in the graveyard shift, you may be, you know, you, you, your, your job, it's not, like, it's not like you all fit in the same uh, uh, part-time uh, uh, bivocational box. Wow, we all work 7 to 3. You might be working sw double shifts, sw swing shifts. I knew one pastor, you know when he did his sermon prep?
He did it all night long because he was a night dispatcher for the county emergency services. That's what he did. His, 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 uh, his sermon work, his study, was when business was slow. Of course, I, I doubt he got much done at New Year's Eve as a dispatcher. I mean, that probably that sermon that week, that probably is a good week to have a hymn sing. <laughs> but I mean, you think about it. You know, all the drunks calling in and all the accidents on the road and stuff. But I mean, it... But I mean, that's what he had to do. I mean, he had to. So he worked a midnight shift, but it was very hard to get him incorporated because he had to sleep during the day for the next shift. And plus, he had to do his pastoral stuff that they did in the church. So that, that is, I think that is an issue that's part of the, and I think there's, that, there's still that kind of stigma because of scheduling that we have to overcome. So that, that's, that, I think that's a factor. The other thing is tradition. Remember the old musical, Fiddler on the Roof? Tradition. Oh, sorry, folks. Probably, I just blew the airwaves all over the place. We all know tradition. We've always done it that way before. We can't change. We've always done it this way. Tradition is a very hard thing to overcome. That's just, that's just the reality. You know, how do we overcome things that have been a habit for years and years and years? And that's one of the things we'll have to talk about. That's where I think we, that's where we can appeal back to Scripture. I think the thing about tradition is a lot of times we don't go back far enough. We talk about going back to the good old days. I think maybe sometimes we need to go back to what was it like in the New Testament times with this whole thing? Um, and there's a lot of areas we struggle with tradition. I could get into whole other topics, you know, our choice of music in the church, uh, all that stuff. That's the other biggie. But I think that we, we look at tradition. But what I have discovered about tradition, basically, when we think about tradition, it's what the church was like when we were teenagers and young adults. I heard one time a definition, and this kind of a side note, that the definition of Christian contemporary music is the, the, the music that was out when the pastor was in youth group. <laughs> and that's true. I mean, you know, me it was Seeky Fest. That was, that was contemporary. Now the, the kids go, that's creepy. But I mean, I think we look at tradition. What, what era were, the, were most of your parishioners when they first got into this church thing? You know, that's the, and if it was a tradition of full-time culture in terms of the pastor was the show, was the main actor, then that's what they think the church is. And why, maybe we need to go back further than that. What was the church like in the New Testament? What did Paul deal with about when he said he wasn't going to seek support from the Corinthians when he was a tent maker and doing all these other things. Maybe, maybe there are examples in Scripture of people who were in leadership in the church that didn't just do the churchy stuff, but were involved in other aspects, other fields of work or whatever. Again, I think sometimes we don't take the tradition. We only go back as far as what we remember. But maybe we need to go back to really the, the kind of the biblical and theological foundations. And again, I think that hopefully would answer that question that was asked just a few minutes ago, that sometimes we need to go further back, and, and we need to constantly, that's where I think preaching and teaching can help a lot too, is what, what does the Bible say about what the church is? Again, 1 Corinthians 12, what does it mean? The five-fold purposes of leadership in the church, that kind of thing. Those are all things I think that are important. A lot of the things I'm repeating, but I think one thing I'm trying to do here is try to repeat things so that we kind of say, okay, here are some themes for us. Okay, the next thing I think is a major factor in the stigma is fear. Change scares us. I think looking at it in terms of the pandemic, the scariest thing about, to me, the pandemic, when is this stupid thing going to be over? And the fear that we're going to be doing this for years and years and years and years and years. I want to encourage you, if you want to really do a neat Bible study, I've been preaching on this text lately. Jer Jeremiah chapter 29. That, you know, I'm, you're familiar with the verses, for I know the plans I have for you for a future and a hope. That's 11 to 14. Look at verses 4 to 11, 4 to 10. Because the Israelites were in exile. 
They were in exile. And Jeremiah writes them a letter to the leaders. Now, in his letter, he did not say, go crawl in a hole and hope it gets over someday. He says, build homes, plant gardens, get married, have kids, then arrange marriages for your children so you can have grandchildren. And then he says, and, and act and pray for the peace and prosperity of where you have been placed. What great advice that is. He also talks about not believing everything that you hear either. He talks about be careful of false prophets. Uh, in other words, not everything on the internet is true. And then, and then, and then, uh, and then really, the third point there is that's when you see the passage, for I know the plans I have for you to give you a future and a hope. The thing I love about that passage is that even in the midst of what we feel like is a wilderness experience for a lot of us, we can either be overcome by fear and go into a hole somewhere and hope it gets over, or we, we can trust in the goodness and the, and the knowledge of the Lord. They were 70 years in captivity. Basically, the Lord says, live life. Jesus said, John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Live life. Live for where you are, not where you wish you were or where you were 50 years ago, but live life. And so often fear is such a major factor in our churches. They're afraid. Um, this will preach, folks. This will preach. I can't tell you how important that is. Again, I think I've preached that sermon at least six times last month. Every church I go to, I preach it. My worry is I'm going to forget where I preach and I might preach it twice. So maybe they need to hear it twice. I don't know. But they, I think that's the fear factor is a major thing, not only for congregants, but for some of us pastors. We don't like what this means to make these changes. Probably one of the most major themes throughout scripture is how many times somebody else, the line says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. And just time after time, you know, the whole Bible is massive. I heard one report said there's 365 times. I don't know if that's true or not. It's, it's in there a lot. Do not be afraid. But I think that is a major factor in a lot of this that our congregations are, are struggling with. And pastors, too. When we're talking about what's going to become of our church. I remember back in 1981, I went through my ordination council. Boy, talk about being put out on the dryer. But in my association, I was, associ I was ordained in the Judson Association of Massachusetts. In that association we had the pillar of mainline denominationalism and over Newton. And then we had us radical evangelicals like I was and a Gordon Conwell. And they were both in my association. <laughs> well the hot button issue of that day is what do we do about nuclear weapons? Somebody asked me that question in my ordination council. Oh, great. So I've got a guy who works at the Charlestown shipyard who thinks we ought to nuke the Russians, who's a hawk, because you know, he feels a strong defense is what our nation needs. Then you had people saying, get rid of all them bombs. They were basically pacifists in their outlook. Well, talk about a hot button issue. I knew this was going to be a question that was not going to be an easy one to answer, because However I said it, people were not going to hear the rest of what I said. But I give the Lord a lot of praise because the answer I gave was, I said, you know what? When I hear these two sides, whether you think we ought to have a stronger military and have more weapons and all that, or whether we should get rid of those bombs, both of you are afraid of the same thing, the survival of our country and our society. You're afraid either way we're going to get wiped out. There was a fear of war. And I said, you know, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And I said, I think maybe rather than just looking at those issues, maybe we look at, need to look at the deeper issues of fear that we're having, whether we're a hawk or a dove or wherever we fit in that. And I said, I think as a pastor, my job, I feel, is to not so much getting into the fray of one side or the other, but really to look at what is it that is guiding you and guiding your decisions, you know, in terms of the fear that you're having towards what's happening in the world today. Everybody had their own feelings about it. But see, 
it was one of those questions, you know, it was, you know, I want, you know, and I want, and because I'm preparing to be a pastor, I really wanted to be in a, a pastoral role there, that I knew in my congregation I was going to have hawks and doves. I mean, every church has them. So how, how, they, how they would respond? How do they, they respond? They, they, they let me get ordained. <laughs> they they perceive an ordination. I said, okay, thank you, Lord. I'm out of here. <laughs> and I'm still here. You know, what can I say? But I mean, I think it was, but I think the fear thing was the thing that struck me. Because even though they were on different sides of the issue, they were both sharing much of the same anxiety and fear that people were having in those days about that issue whether you're a hawk or a dove. And I think sometimes, I think that's one of the problems in a lot of the times in the church today. We, 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 we make decisions based on fear, whether it's part-time versus full-time or any of this other stuff. And then maybe we really need to be looking at what is it that guides people's decisions to begin? What's our, what are the deep inner spiritual issues of faith? Trusting God when times are tough, when there's a lot of anxiety. And I'll tell you what, the COVID thing has caused a lot of anxiety. I have not seen this much anxiety since Vietnam. I mean, we had our moments. We had 9-11. We had that stuff. This, this, to me, is the most radical thing I've seen happen in society in, in really pretty much my whole life, in my opinion. And people are afraid. And then you couple that with churches that are just barely hanging out and trying to struggle through this. Then the fear just goes... <laughs> And that, that is where I think pastorally we can begin to really try to... Uh, what does Scripture say about this? What does Scripture say about our fears? What does Scripture say? Jeremiah 29 is a great place to start. Just to, to do, a, do a sermon on that. About what do we do when we're in captivity, when things are not going our way? What do we do? That'll preach.